Lecture 5, Greek Culture. We will continue studying the Greeks, but this time through their culture, religion, literature, philosophy, theater, and art. The various aspects of Greek culture made a lasting and deep impression on Western civilization, principally, as pointed out in the previous lecture, because Alexander the Great established a vast empire held together by a Greek way of life that the Romans looked upon, looked up, after they replaced the Greeks and established their own Roman Empire. Representing the Roman positive approach to Greek culture, Virgil wrote, Others, the Greeks, will hammer out bronze that breathes with more delicacy than us, draw out living features from marble, plead their causes better, trace with instruments the movement of the skies and tell the rise in the constellations. Remember, Roman, it is for you to rule the nations with your power. That will be your skill, to crown peace with law, to spare the conquered and subdue the proud. Greek Gods In his work called Theogony, the Greek poet Hesiod, Hesiod lived from 750 to 650 BC, describes the origins of the gods, the Greek gods, and traces their genealogies. And I include in verse and in, in your transcript in verse form his description of how the gods came to be and i recommend you look at that carefully and notice and you'll notice when you do so how chaos existed before the gods and that chaos also had a beginning what hesiod means by this and what chaos is is not clear what is clear is that contrary to the book of genesis Hesiod did not claim that creative intelligence is at the origin of all things that were created out of nothing. Rather, as explained by Apostolus and Athanasakas, quote, it is a physical world born not out of nothing, but from the unknown. The first fundamental realities that Hesiod names as coming into existence after chaos, or along with chaos are earth, Gaia, the abyss, Tartarus, and love, Eros. In a virgin state, Gaia gives birth to the starry heavens, Uranus, and the seas, Pontus, and the hills. Earth, the heavens, the mountains, and the sea are for Hesiod, the first four elements of the world. Chaos also is responsible for giving rise to four realities, darkness, night, light, and day. After the earth experienced a sweet union of love with her virgin-born heavenly son, by invading him to cover her on every side, she gives birth to the Titans. Finally, she gives birth to the light last Titan, Kronos, who becomes the Titans' leader. In the following verses, of after the transcript, if you look at that, Hesiod describes Mother Earth giving birth to a one-eyed giant creature called the Cyclops, and three other even mightier creatures, each with a hundred hands and fifty heads. Hating these monster children, Mother Earth calls upon her titan son Cronos to punish her husband Uranus. Cronos agrees and hides with the sickle while his father spreads himself full upon her. Seizing upon this opportune moment, Cronos castrates his father and then casts his father's organs into the sea, causing it to foam. Soon after, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, is born out of the sea's foam. The Italian Florentine Renaissance artist Botticelli depicted the birth of Aphrodite by reinterpreting the myth within a Christian context. And in your transcript, is, I supply a beautiful picture that Botticelli painted called The Birth of Venus. And the angelic figures blowing a modest-looking Aphrodite across the waters represent angels introducing the Blessed Mother who is bringing divine love into the world. Kronos had relations with the goddess Rhea, who bears him beautiful children. Kronos swallows each of his children as they come forth from the womb to his mother's knees with this intent that no other of the proud sons of heaven should hold the kingly office among the deathless gods. In grief, Rhea appeals to her parents, Earth and Heaven, who advise her, before she gives birth to her next son, Zeus, to wrap a big stone in swaddling baby clothes and present that to her husband to eat, which he does. 
When Zeus is strong enough, he drives his father from his throne and rules the gods in his place. Zeus's authority was also challenged by another god when Prometheus stole fire from Zeus and gives it to men. Zeus punishes Prometheus by binding him to a mountain face where he daily faced an eagle. During the day, the eagle ate Prometheus's liver. During the night, his liver grew back. Eventually, Zeus decides to wipe out the inhuman race, which had become increasingly violent after being given the power of fire. In punishment, Zeus sends down a torrential downpour that quickly inundates the whole earth and water. Living among the men is Prometheus' son, Deucalion. As told by Lucian of Samosata, lived 125 to 180 AD, in the Syrian goddess, they were extremely violent and committed lawless deeds, for they neither kept oaths nor welcomed strangers nor spared suppliants. As punishment for these offenses, the great disaster came upon them. Suddenly the earth poured forth a flood of water, heavy rains fell, rivers rushed in down in torrents, and the sea rose on high until everything became water and all the people perished. Deocalion alone among the men was left for the second race because of his prudence and piety. This was the manner of this salvation. He embarked his children and his wives into a great ark, which he possessed, and he himself went in. As he boarded, <coughs> pigs and horses, species of lions, snakes, and every kind of creature that grazes on earth came to him, all of them in pairs. He welcomed all, and none harmed him. Instead, from some divine source, there was a kind of friendship among the, and in a single ark, all s sailed as long as the flood prevailed. This, then, is the story which Greeks tell about Deocalion. End of quote. According to Apollodorus of Athens, for nine days and nights Deocalion's ark floats safely in the flood until it comes to rest on a mountaintop. After the rain stops and the flood waters subside, Deocalion and his family disembark and pray to Zeus, asking Zeus for men to be created. Following Zeus' instructions, Deocalion and his wife Pyra throw stones over their heads. Pyra's stones turn into women, while Deocalion's changes into men. The first son he has with Pyra he names Helen. Helen becomes the father of the Greek people. As is evident, this account of a great flood bears similarities with the biblical account in Genesis. The Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, which was written around 2,100 years before the birth of Christ, is another ancient text that also describes a flood caused by God in which a man named Utnapishtim builds an ark and survives. This epic is but one of many flood stories from ancient cultures. The Catholic philosopher Joseph Pieper, in explaining this phenomenon, from a faith perspective, refers to the Augustinian concept of an original revelation, and I quote from Pieper, And yet it would be an inappropriate narrowing of the true state of affairs to see sacred tradition realized only in the realm of biblical and Christian doctrine. It is narrow-minded to define tradition, taken as process, as act, as nothing more than the ecclesiastical proclamation of belief which began with the apostles and was continued by their successors with the same authority. Such a limitation of the term is even theological, theologically questionable. Can one dispute so simply the claim of the mythical tradition in the pre- and non-Christian realm to preserve through the ages knowledge which equally comes down from a divine source, especially insofar as we are convinced that there existed long before the apostles something like an, an original revelation, this last concept, which we have mentioned before, does not have an especially high standing in the current discussion, if indeed it is mentioned at all. It has been at home in Christian theology, however, since the earliest times and will always recur to memory as something indispensable. The concept of original revelation betokens that at the beginning of history, an event took place of a divine speech directed especially to the man, that is, to all men, and that time has entered into the sacred tradition of all peoples in their myths, that is, and is preserved and pre present there more or less recognizably. Augustine, in his late work, The Retractiones, formulated this thought admittedly in a way that is all too easy to understand, 
and has in fact often been misunderstood. The very thing which is now called the Christian religion existed among the ancients. Indeed, it has never been absent since the beginning of the human race, until Christ appeared in the flesh. That was when the true religion which already existed began to be called the Christian religion. End of quote. Greek literature, along with works on the gods such as the mentioned of what we just mentioned in Hesiod's Theogony, Greek literature also included epic poetry, lyric poetry, and plays. Two of the most significant epic works were written by Homer, 600 BC. These epics are the Iliad and the Odyssey. Epic poetry. The Iliad describes a Trojan war between the Trojans and Greeks that erupted after the Trojan man, Paris, stole an exquisitely beautiful woman called Heron, Helen, queen of Sparta, married to the Spartan king Menelaus. Helen, feeling remorseful, feeling, feeling sorrowful, reproaches Paris for his evil deeds by saying, Would that you had fallen rather by the hand of that brave man who was my husband. You used to brag that you were a better man with hands and spear than Menelaus. Go, but I then challenge him again. But I should advise you not to do so, for if you are foolish enough to meet him in single combat, you will soon all be his spear. Unashamed, Paris responds, Wife, do not vex me with your approaches. This time, with the help of Minerva, Menelaus has vanquished me. Another time I myself might be victor, for I too have gods that will stand by me. Come, let us lie down together and make friends. Never yet was I so passionately enamored of you as at this moment, not even when I first carried you off from Lacedaemon and sailed away with you, not even when I had converse with you upon the couch of love in the island of Crane, was I so enthralled by desire of you as of now. These words persuaded Helen to allow Paris to lead her towards the bed, a bed that symbolizes the proximate cause of a terrible war. The remote cause of the war, the Trojan War, was due to a golden apple from Eris, goddess of strife, which the goddess Aphrodite won in a beauty contest among the goddesses. The judge of the beauty contest was none other than Paris, chosen by Zeus. In exchange for choosing her as the most beautiful of the goddesses, Aphrodite rewards Paris by causing the married woman married woman Helen, to become infatuated with him. In describing certain events of the Trojan War, the Iliad revolves around the Greek hero Achilles, who, according to legend, is invulnerable from being wounded except for his heel. According to Greek mythology, knowing of this vulnerability, Paris kills Achilles by shooting him in the heel, hence the term Achilles' heel. The Odyssey takes place after the city of Troy has fallen to the Greeks. It describes a journey back home from the Trojan War of the Greek war warrior hero Odysseus. He is traveling to his kingdom of Ithaca in order to be reunited with his wife Penelope. Lyric Poetry Another major form of Greek literature was poetry written in lyric form. In other words, often composed to be sung and at times accompanied by a stringed instrument called a lyre. At other times, this was poetry. This poetry was accompanied by a wind instrument called an aulos. Still, other ancient Greek poetry, categorized as lyric, may have been sung but were not accompanied by any musical instrument. The foremost earliest Greek lyric poets were recognized as follows, and I won't read all the names. Like you'll find them in your transcript. I would like, though, to read a beautiful poem on death composed by the woman poet Sappho. Death is an evil, so the gods decree, so they have judged, and such must rightly be. Our mortal view for they who dwell in high had never lived had it been good to die. And so the poet's house should never know of tears and lamentations any show. Such things befit not us who deathless sing of love and beauty, gladness and the spring. No hint of grief should mar the features of our dreams of endless beauty, lasting love, for they reflect the joy in violet, eternal calm that fronts whatever fate. Tell us, my darling, grieve no more, I pray, let wandering winds thy sorrow bear away, and all our care, my daughter, let thy smile shine through thy tears and gladden me the while. Greek Theater 
The ancient Greeks also wrote plays, two very basic forms or tragedies, primarily serious plays drawn from myths, and comedies based on funny contemporary events. The most recognized playwrights from the 500 BCs to the 200 BCs were the Athenians Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, and Menander. The last two, Aristophanes and Menander, wrote comedies, while the other three wrote tragedies. The majority of the plays composed by these Athenian playwrights were intended to be performed in a theater built in honor of Dionysius, god of wine and fertility. Greek philosophy. A few of the most influential Greek philosophers were Thales, Democritus, the Sophists, Heraclitus, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Thales attempted to discover the most basic element of the cosmos. Thales concluded that it is water. Others disagreed with him, including Democritus, who asserted that everything is made up of tiny odd ship particles called atoms that are constantly colliding and recombining with one another. The Sophists rejected the importance of speculating what is most true and constant. Instead, they honed their skills and their pupil skills by defeating an opponent in argument regardless of their position. Parmenides and Heraclides were also not overly concerned with what element is most basic to the universe. However, they were deeply concerned with the determining what aspect of reality is primary. Parmenides argued that 